I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. I'm interested in why people believe liberalism remains a viable and valuable political and social philosophy. What are its limits and weaknesses? What are the threats to liberalism? And what future does it have? My guest today is Claire Lehman, the founder and director of an online opinion and analysis place called Quillet. It's in its, se- it's in its seventh year. Welcome, Claire. Thanks for having me, Rob. For those who may not have caught it, tell us what Quillet is. Well, Quillette's an online magazine, and we also have a podcast, the Quillette Podcast, and our catchphrase is Free Thought Lives, and we've been going since 2015, and our orientation is liberal, but we we think of ourselves as defending enlightenment values. So we put forward ideas and arguments grounded with evidence, and we use reason rather than emotional argument. And we, 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 we try and figure out what's going on in the world rather than simply proselytize our moral or political position. And uh, being able to do that requires a liberal outlook because You know, one can't explore different ideas and different theories and different hypotheses without the freedom to explore. It's been a great success, I believe. Yes, it's been successful. Uh, It became quite successful in 2018 and grew quite rapidly in that year. And since then, our growth has been more gradual, but uh, our revenue grows incrementally every month, which is nice. And our subscribers grow up every month and um, we you you know it's a sustainable business model and we have a very engaged audience so you know yeah we're quite lucky in that respect because media is a difficult industry why did you think it had to be started what 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 was about was going on back that seven years ago when you thought i'll have a go at this yeah interesting question because in 2015 this was Mm -hmm. pre-trump it was before Many people realised that social justice activism was sort of going out of control. And I I wasn't a writer and I wasn't a journalist. I was actually a graduate student in psychology, but I, I did have an interest in writing. And I was writing an article about left wing bias in psychology and how it was skewing research research questions and research outcomes and Mm -hmm. I'd written this article about a psychologist called Lee Jussum and a a lot of the article was about groupthink and now when I was writing the article I thought I'm not going to be able to get this published because the uh, publications that are interested in science are not going to want to publish something that challenges left-wing narratives. And the conservative publications that I was aware of at the time, I thought, aren't going to be interested in publishing something on psychology. So I thought that there was a gap in the market for something that was um, rigorous and scientifically minded and analytical, but that was not skewed to the left and so that's what I created with Quillette and so you were the first author the only yeah, author has first time. Yeah, yeah but I had a network I, I was on Twitter at the time and right. I had identified a few writers that I thought were insightful and original and I invited them to contribute and they did and their articles took off <laughs> so the rest is history why, why would a, a scientific endeavour have a political bias. Yeah, well, it's not something that happens overnight. I don't think people go into these scientific careers or research careers intending to have a bias. Well, most of the time they don't. Some, you know, obviously some 
do. But what happens over time is that like-minded people group together. They, they share the same blind spots. So like-minded people group together. They share the same sort of political outlook and perspective. They're unaware of their own blind spots and these blind spots sort of magnify and becomes... Self-reinforcing. Exactly. So uh, an important thing when thinking about scholarship or any kind of institution that is searching for truth is to have ideological diversity because we all have blind spots. I have blind spots. You would have them. We all have them. And it helps if people can see things from a slightly different perspective from us and they can see what we're missing. Contestability is crucial. Yeah, and um, unfortunately in psychology, uh, because a lot of academics are sort of on the left, they've not been aware of their own biases over time and they've sort of grown bigger and bigger and bigger over time to the point where some fields of psychology, such as social psychology, are have, are producing quite shoddy research. Um, not all parts of, not all fields in psychology are shoddy, and there's there is robust and reliable work that comes out of psychology. But some subdisciplines are tainted by political bias. That's for sure. And, and the, the purpose of Quillet is to write a framework for open, scientific, yeah. and yeah. analytical discussion. I'm going to ask you: It is possible for those on the right even those who call themselves liberals, yeah. to effectively become tribal as well. Oh, absolutely. So h- h- how do you guard against that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm sure that I've been tribal myself in the past. And um, well, that, well, That's what they would say anyway about you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's really easy to become tribal and to um, sort of demonise and um, uh, sort of caricature the ideological enemy. And I think social media in particular uh, exacerbates tribalism because what it does is it it allows people with similar outlooks and perspectives to group together, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but once people are grouped together, they start sort of grandstanding in front of each other. It's a kind of a kind of showing up there. Showing off, yeah. Yeah. And, and Plus the short form nature of social media means you can't really have any serious argument. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. But it's more than just that, though, isn't it? It's more than just social media. It's, it's, there are some cultural issues around, which what led you in the first place to think mm. you needed something like this. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the dangerous things about where society is headed are the silos and the echo chambers where one side is stuck in its own media mm. silo and echo chamber and another side is stuck in its silo and echo chamber and both have no idea what the other people what the others are talking about i mean if you you know i mean it's not so bad in australia but if you look at the united states People consume completely different media diets and they they almost don't share the same reality anymore. You know, some people watch Fox News and YouTube all day long. Other people watch CNN and go on Facebook and they're seeing completely different news stories. And, (laughs) you know, they're not... The, the, it's the, there's an increasing inability of people to talk to each other. So, you, so therefore, you're keen for you, what your your project is not just for the for the right, but for the left as well to be involved with you. You're keen to have a, an audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not in danger, are you? Kicking enemies on both sides. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I do have enemies on both sides, and it's very unpleasant. It is. Yeah. It may be vindication too. I don't know. Yeah. Into, into they yeah. are. Do you think that liberalism, as a general philosophy, is in trouble or struggling at the moment? Not in Australia. I'm, I'm not talking about politics here. I'm talking yeah. about the philosophy. The philosophy, yeah. They're quite different, actually. Yeah, no, I understand. Not in Australia. And the reason why I don't think it's in trouble in Australia is because we're a very wealthy nation and mm. uh, people have security and uh we're a freedom-loving nation in terms of our lifestyle, 
And I think that with liberalism is quite safe here in Australia. I, I worry that it's in danger in other parts of the world. There are populist authoritarian movements in other parts of the world. And in, in the United States, because their culture is so influential internationally, that we have a risk of importing their populist authoritarian movements. And I see these movement, movements as being both left-wing and right-wing. So on the left, we, they have Black Lives Matter yes. and the yes. very authoritarian sort of identity politics movements. And on the right, there is this um, populist kind of, I guess that you could say the uh, personality cult around Trumpism. I mean, we're at less of a risk of importing that here, but even so, some of the conspiratorial theories and things can get can be exported out here, and there's there's somewhat of a risk. Yes, indeed. It is is um is, is one of the threats. I don't know to put this. One of the threats to what you call enlightenment values, by which you mean trying to be magnificent on evidence. Mm. Free discussion rather than a, an ideology, yeah. Because there is, it is in the Enlightenment an ideological side. Yeah, the terror was a product of the Enlightenment. Of course, yeah. There, there seems to me that the, the doing the attempt to do good is is being lifted up rather than simply find the truth. I put it this way. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we should be doing good. Yeah, <laughs> and seeking the welfare of others. That seems to me very laudable. But somehow, other it seems to be intersecting with trying to keep in touch with what's real in the world. Um, I'm thinking of uh, in, why in social psychology, for example, yeah. and elsewhere, certain conclusions can't be allowed. Yes. Certain education has to be turned into a form of, in, of removing social division. So you get a kind of woke social justice engagement. It seems it's difficult because you can't be against social justice, no, yeah. but you can be against it in certain forms. Yeah, and I, I think uh, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt makes a good point and he says that you can't you can't really have social justice without truth so if you're looking at yes. if you're looking at a, yes. a vexed problem so uh, if you're looking at po poverty in a certain demographic of society you're better able to solve that problem if you have an accurate picture of the problem but if you start, if you start from a certain conclusion, say if you say you want to look at um, uh, violence against women, if you start with the conclusion that violence against women is caused by the patriarchy and sexist attitudes, that might lead to all sorts of interventions and campaigns, but they might not actually do much. However, if you start from if you start from the question of, well, we don't actually know what are the fundamental variables which are causing this problem, let's go out and study them. Maybe you get back some results that say that things like family breakdown, impact violence, alcohol, the availability of alcohol is impacting violence, um, uh, you know, uh, lack of jobs in a particular region is impacting violence. If you take sort of an evidence-based scientific approach and you're going to come back with answers that are more com more nuanced and potentially more accurate and then you're going to be able to implement a solution that actually works. So the problem with a lot of social justice activism is that it, it starts out with the conclusions yes. and then sort of works backwards. You know, it starts out with an ideological conclusion. Everything's caused by racism, sexism, some other ism, and then a whole lot of money and energy is spent on on fixing these problems, which do need to be fixed. But then the interventions don't end up working and, anyway because they and, haven't got. And the, when they don't work, what what happens then? <laughs> well, we need. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of education debate. Yeah. Where we've had very big increase in funding, but results have gone backwards. Yeah, since, exactly. Which is a shocking thing. Yeah. And yet, except for people here at the Centre for Independent Studies, I read in the, in the ordinary press, the problem is we we need more money. Yeah. 
And I thought that may be right, but I need a little more correlation between the money and the outcome. Yeah. So I think a big problem on the left is that uh, interventions are judged upon their intention, not their outcome. And now any intervention needs to be judged on its outcome first and foremost. And, and And to assess an intervention's outcome, you have to have You know, you have to have rigorous studies. You need follow-up studies. You need to know what you're measuring. You need a scientific approach, which is an enlightenment approach. And and, 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 and many of your articles of this character in in, uh, in Quillette? Well, I mean, we we certainly, uh, we look at the evidence. We look at, you know, what, we're, we're very mindful of the fact that, you know, just because something sounds good on paper doesn't mean that translates into real world results. And, um, and, and, and we're used, we like to look at data and um, historical evidence. We take an empirical approach rather yes. than just an emotional approach. I'm, I'm Rob Forsyth. This is a Liberals in Question, and my interesting guest today is Claire Lemon. Claire, can you think of any, you may not be able to put them on the spot here, yeah. any places where the take it for granted realities have been overturned by, by more thoughtful and empirical approaches? I mean, you gave one earlier when you said, Domestic violence, I think the assumption is disrespect of, for women. Teach boys to be well respectful, and that is, by the way, a very important thing, but that will be the key mm. to overcome. And I, I, I'm not across this, but I'm wondering, is, that, is, there, is there actually empirical evidence for that or is this an assumption? And the other matters to do with, um, yeah, that uh, particularly in the area of sex, mm. it's thought um, sexual assault is, is it's about power, not about sex. Yeah. That that might be true, but I wonder whether that's too simple. And I wonder, I wonder whether you've shown in your study any any, any of these take it for granted assumptions yeah. which have turned out to be much more complicated. Yeah, well, I mean that's a big one actually. The <laughs> really, I didn't know. That's very helpful to remind me of that. Yeah, no, no, no. We we actually just published an article on Harvey Weinstein, and it was a long article and it was written by a an expert psychologist who works with sex offenders and he did there uh, one part of the article is about this assumption that uh, rape is about power not sex which is not accurate from his perspective and I think if you talk to any psychologist who works with sex offenders they will confirm that it's not the, the, the motivation from their point of view isn't power uh, that that's a that's a myth. That's an orthodoxy that's become conventional wisdom on the left. And but there are quite a few orthodoxies on the left that have become conventional wisdom, and we do like to challenge them. Mm. But we like to challenge them in a way that is not purposefully inflammatory, uh, because you know we don't want to necessarily alienate people. And we, we don't want to inflame sort of tribal uh, tensions or affiliations. And, and, and to be honest, there are, a myth, there are orthodoxies on the right as well. Anyone can get anywhere if they just try hard enough. That's a really good one, actually. Well, that, that, that's, forgetting about that's, class yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, 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 and uh, many other things can hold people back of a social. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a really good one. This idea that uh, any you know personal responsibility is all that matters, and anyone can pull themselves up by yes. their bootstraps. Yeah, I I think that's a mistaken assumption as well. And you know, my my training is in psychology, and I'm familiar with the evidence on individual differences. And so, part of individual differences is uh, cognitive ability for one, and personality. And people are born with a range of different personality traits. I mean, some of them are created, some of them are influenced by socialisation, but we're also born uh, with innate kind of aptitudes, abilities and... um, Potentials. And and personalities Mm. as well. And some people are extremely industrious and some people are find it hard to get going and it's not necessarily a moral failing i mean we you know we're very we can be very quick to judge people who are uh you know we might see people as lazy or um you know uh 
lacking in conscientiousness, but sometimes these traits are, sometimes these things are out of people's control mm. and cognitive ability is generally out of anyone's, out of someone's control. Like I, I cannot be a nuclear physicist no matter how hard I try. Right. And if I hit the books every day, like I don't think I could ever become a nuclear physicist. I just don't have that level of cognitive ability. The myth on the right is that there are, there are no, no barriers other than will yeah or uh, and yeah. i see your point so uh, so i'm in favor of a welfare state for that reason yes, yes yeah because i do think some people just for for no fault of their own do need some extra well, liberalism in its historic form has often supported welfare yeah states, yeah, yeah particularly the great reforms in, in the united kingdom yeah uh, because liberalism is, not, is also about freedom for yeah positive what, liberty yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned jonathan Haidt a moment ago i i I hope the listener has heard of Brother Hate because that book on um, righteous mind. the righteous mind uh, was a was a was a wonderful eye, eye opener to me, yeah. and uh, he draws attention to the fact that there are factors going on other than simple rationality. That's right. Yeah, I wanted to ask what you thought about that to your theory about rationality because yeah. there are different ways in which we see the world or, or aspects of moral intuitions. intuitions yes, yeah, that's the word. Yeah, yeah. And often you're fighting on um, the arguments are between not just facts, but between the whole way that issues are approached. Mm. Do, do you want to comment on, on Haidt's work and whether that is a helpful insight? And what does it mean for your interest in rationality? Yeah, well, I, I think Haidt's work is brilliant. And uh, I think, you know, he's, I mean, it's. I think it's a theory or a hypothesis. It's not, you know, an established no. law. There's, any kind of scientific theory can always be disproven. But I think it's generally accepted that humans come with all sorts of biases and, uh, you know, we're not, we're not computers. We don't think perfectly rationally and we're social creatures. And so yes. a lot of our thinking is driven by or motivated by how we appear in front of our tribe. So, and tribes group together around moral issues so that's one of the reasons why social media is so toxic because people group together around moral issues and then they're constantly competing with each other about how moral, you know, trying to be the, the most moral yes. person and then you get this um, phenomenon of virtue signaling. <laughs> Which goes on not just on the left but on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's this competition of who can be the most moral. And uh, so I think that's, I think Jonathan Hyde is right. And then, but the thing about rationality is that I think just because we're not necessarily automatically rational doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be. Hyde's put maybe his key point is that Hume was right and Locke was wrong about human rationality. That yeah, yeah. we are, the passions do 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 drive us in a way that yeah, people. No, don't, I, and, and I think he was right, and often our rationality is an effort to catch up. Yeah, no, and I think he's probably correct, but I also think that. That would, so, uh, that would be back to Augustine, I suspect, yeah, that belief. Yeah. I think, um, like, I'm, I'm also a big fan of Steven Pinker, who is, a, is an advocate for reason and rationality. And, um, you know, the two, the two, reading both of those men side by side often, side by side often goes together well. But, uh, like, an analogy would be um, the scientific method. So the scientific method isn't, perfect and postmodernists will often say that you know science is biased because scientists the individual the humans practicing science are human and they're therefore biased but they use that as an excuse to throw through the scientific method in the bin altogether and I think that's wrong I think that just because there is bias in an enterprise doesn't mean that you discard it altogether. You just try and make it a little bit better. You just try and improve it. And I think it's the same for us. We're not perfectly rational beings by any stretch of the imagination, but that doesn't mean we should just succumb to being purely emotional, tribal, I'm not going animalistic to creatures. Yes, I'm not going to fly in an aeroplane designed by someone who thinks it's all yeah. <laughs> it's emotion. You can just do it from gut instinct, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Does liberalism have a blind, its own blind spots? We've kind of explored that a bit already, haven't we? Being individual focused, does it does it miss other 
class and col- colonial issues that because the rise of liberalism was at the same time as the rise of Western colonialism. Now, a lot of the en- enemies of liberalism claim, claim it's deeply tainted. You see that more in America than here, I think, but the fear of particularly the Black Lives Matter extreme, yeah. reacting against the genuine profound issue of chattel slavery in the United States. Mm. Um, well, I think, I think liberalism isn't a theory of the world and a theory of human behaviour. It's, it's aspirational. Right. And I think healthy societies do protect the integrity and sovereignty of the individual Mm. And when society, it's when societies break down into sort of sectarianism or war that, you know, the individual, the sanctity of the individual is the first thing to sort of go by the wayside and people are viewed by the, you know, in terms of their race or their class or their gender. You know, we're not seen as individual humans. We're just seen as a representative of our group right and so i think it's a i think liberalism is a very healthy philosophy in it and respect for the individual and the sovereignty of the individual is emerges in healthy societies and when when you see it the the sovereignty of the individual sort of um discarded that's that's dangerous and that's when societies are sort of breaking down i think one of the themes in this uh, whole series of podcasts is that I- liberalism isn't really an ideology, mm. it, it, which is both a strength and a weakness. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, people find it hard to prosecute or advocate on liberalism, liberalism's behalf. Yes. Yeah. What we want: independent thinking based on reason. When we want it, as soon as it possible. You can't, you can't do. You can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you optimistic about? Um, the future of liberalism in in in, in the future. Um, there's a lot of anxiety. It's easy to get moral panic about postmodernism. Yeah, and I, and I can see why. And yeah, there are there are some terrible examples. Yeah, um, you you can't tell the future, but uh, what do you think is going to happen? Well, to all that? you know, it's funny because I'm optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. Oh. I think that we live in a, in a, a time of immense change and I think you know lots of people who value liberalism and and who value enlightenment values and reason and, and progress are coming together and forming communities whether you know in their local areas or online and so and people are, are forming networks at the same time Populists and authoritarians yes. are also forming networks, and so and it's hard to, it's really hard to predict the future how things will unfold. I mean, we couldn't have predicted the pandemic five yeah. years ago, and and these big global shocks can have ramifications that we can't, we can't, just cannot predict. And there, there, I take it you don't hold the view, you may hold the view, that liberalism is somehow the natural state of human being. If only we could remove all this bad stuff. It would just emerge. That's not true, is it? It's a product of a, t- of a contingent yeah, world. It is. No, it's not the natural state. The natural state is tribalism. Mm. So our natural state is living in tribes, living in poverty, and being in a perpetual state of anxiety because we might be attacked from by a neighbouring tribe. And in tribal societies, you know, women don't fare very well. Indeed. And, Indeed. Uh, and they're pretty violent, and uh, it's only with civilization, it's only with institutions, the rule of law, free markets, and capitalism, and also sort of moral cultures that uh, value, you know, human dignity, uh, that you get peace and human flourishing. And I think these these institutions are precious, and they only emerged in the West. Uh, over you know they emerge gradually over hundreds of years yes. and they're very very precious and they're, they're, they're I mean they're robust in the sense that they've been around for so long they can't disappear overnight but at the same time they're fragile because lots of people just aren't aware of how precious they are yes. 
and the, the, well, there's a complacency be... in the West. The, 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 these insti- I'm glad we're talking about institutions as we come towards the end of our talk because mm. it, liberalism can sometimes forget the, the crucial value of institutions. Yes, yeah. Um, as, as, uh, by, by, I don't just mean institutions, organisations. I mean the, the moral shaping of, of um, the institution yeah. of marriage, institution yeah. of... That's right, yeah. And I would include the church in that. I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I think that, you know, you wouldn't have um, liberalism without Christianity. Yes. Uh, so, like, I, th- I think there's an ap- that there was a progression and you, that there's foundational institutions, the way society is shaped around shared uh, moral norms that gave rise. I don't know if you know the work of Tom Holland. I don't mean the Spider-Man man. I mean, yeah, uh, the, I mean the historian. Uh, the historian yes. yeah. He, uh, I don't know where he stands himself, but he drew attention to the fact that the ancient world, which many people think is the source of enlightenment values, in certain areas is totally alien to us in the That's way it right. treats the weak yeah. and the poor. Yeah. And when, when I hear constant talking these days about harm for the weak by people who are, you realise you're hearing an echo of, 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 of a, the, mm. Perhaps the early, the early Christian world coming through, That's right, even yeah. though the morality has been reduced, thinned down to just harm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which may be a problem of liberalism because that, Mill said that was the one reason why my liberty should be restricted by you. I shouldn't harm you. Mm. That strike me. That's libertarian liberalism. Mm. It seems to me doesn't doesn't really understand institutions properly. Mm. Potentially, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one last question: If you're right that liberalism grew, grew out of a certain historical culture, I guess Western European. Yeah. Christendom, in a yeah, way. Yeah. Even though, ironically, the Enlightenment was a revolt against Christendom. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a universal yeah. philosophy, but it, it, so it, it originated. So it arises in overthrowing authoritarian rule of church and crown. Yeah, will, will liberalism survive if those roots themselves wither? We're seeing that in the West, significant decline of, of religi- religion, these things in the mm. West, and it's re- partly a result of the success of, of our prosperity. Yeah, yeah. That's a big question and I don't think I'm qualified to answer it, but I would just say that just because we're not religious per se doesn't mean we aren't carrying the traditions of Christianity. I think a lot of people are cultural Christians without realising it. They may not attend church, but they they still internalise it. Well, this was Tom Holland. He'd given up the Christian faith explicitly. Yeah. Just go to his great horror. He still was one, at yeah. least at the level of his deep values. Yeah, that's right. It's 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 more about you know the um, a, a moral sort of outlook yes. on the world, and I think a lot of people are cultural Christians, and I think it's I, I think it will so will last and it will survive. Yeah, I, I'm I'm optimistic that it will. Yeah. It's we're living through a precarious time, but I think I think we'll um, get through it. And um, we'll rediscover what's important to us, fundamentally important to us. I'm optimistic about that. Well, on that note, I want to thank you, Claire, Claire Lehman. On a very positive note, I'm glad to say, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been very, very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for having me, Rob. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.